This episode of Shadowversity actually has a very cool sponsor. It's Campfire Pro. Now, as an author myself, I'm very well aware of how tricky it can be to keep track of all the fine details of a story you're trying to write or a campaign world you're trying to create for Dungeons and Dragons, video games, any number of reasons. Well, it actually doesn't need to be nearly as difficult as I found myself when I was keeping everything in a single text document. Campfire Pro offers heaps of features to help you out in this regard. The character sheets you can make will help you keep track of character details, their backstories, the uh, the timeline that you're creating, the individual plot points of the story you're making, and also you can mark all the plot related points and location details on one of your very own maps that you can integrate into Campfire Pro as well. And in extension to that, you'll also want to check out their new world building pack, which gives you a whole host of features to keep track of the races, the cultures, the magic systems, magic items, religions, philosophies, languages all there to help you out so a very useful tool it's also fully private and secure on top of all these other features campfire pro and all its features are available for a one-off purchase of 49.99 and the world building pack is available for an additional 24.99 so do away with all those documents, spreadsheets, word files where it's so hard to look up everything, but keep everything together in its own easily referenced state where everything you need is at your fingertips and it's easily accessible. So if you want to check out Campfire Pro, there is a link in the description below. Greetings. I am Shad, and I have a very special episode here for you because I'm holding something particularly awesome. This is popularly known as the Instant Legolas, invented by good friend of the channel, Jörg Sprave of the Slingshot channel. When I saw his invention, I was so intrigued by the uh, the benefits that would come out of this system. If you haven't seen Jörg's videos, okay, what it is, it is a uh, basically rapid fire attachment to a bow, okay? The arrows are actually housed in this inbuilt magazine. By pushing the attachment down, it will uh, kind of load in the arrow, and then when you pull it back, you can aim and shoot. And so it's basically made for not only rapid fire, but also as an aiming assist, because if you've ever done traditional archery, which I have, aiming is its own unique kind of beast. And so I was so intrigued by Jörg's invention that I actually wanted to see what would happen if you attached it to a, a proper war bow, you know, of legitimate draw weight. And so I sent him a war bow, okay? And if you go over to his channel, you'll be able to see his, you know, first kind of experimentations attaching the sill to this war bow and how he went shooting it. Because I wanted to see if this could have been a viable thing for a war bow, and Jörg basically showed that it is. Now he sent it back to me so I can give this a test run, figure out the pros and cons, see how well it works, and then also share my thoughts about it kind of from the background of my understanding of medieval weapons and armor. Would this thing have been adopted large scale historically? So I'm going to share my final thoughts towards the end of this video after I give this a proper test run. Now, this is a proper war bow, okay? I actually have a video on this channel where I weigh it, okay? I draw it and measure its draw distance at about a 29 inch drawer. This war bow comes in at 101 pounds, all right? And then I also had a go at drawing it myself. And I was able to pull it back, but I'm not able to really draw it with an arrow and shoot yet. I still need to build up, you know, the, the strength to do it easier and more consistently. Although since filming this video, I've had a bit more practice and I can fully draw this bow with an arrow attached and fully drawing it without an arrow has gotten a lot easier. So getting stronger. Because this is the next really intriguing thing about Jörg's design. He has a drawing assist that is inbuilt to this system. Now, on this one, he's done it with rubber bands, okay? But he's also shown that you could do it with medieval technology by adding an additional bow attachment to the front, which is just brilliant. Oh man, I love the things that Jörg comes up with. So this is a very legitimate thing that could have been built in the medieval period if uh, someone like Jörg just lived that time, right, and invented it. And so I get to test this out with the drawing assist, having tried to draw this already, okay, just by itself, this war bow. And like I said, I was able to draw it back, but for consistent shooting it, I'm not there yet. And so I'm really, you know, interested in just trying this out to see how easy or difficult it is to draw. So I'm going to do it, but because I'm finding the sword is already getting away, let's take off the sword and do it just so 
you know, uh, no accidents will happen. So the first interesting thing is that to knock it, it's going to be taking a measure of strength already to push this down and attach it. Now there's kind of like an inbuilt safety here, so I need to take this out so I'll be able to push it all the way down and let it catch towards the end. All right, that's actually not too difficult, but it's that kind of last bit. And I want to be doing this in one smooth motion, so I just want to catch it. All right, so now it's on the string, and gee, it's, you know, this is working beautifully already. That was very smooth, okay? So now I'm going to be drawing this to see how easy or difficult it is uh, compared to just the bow by itself. So with the drawing assist, let's have a look. So uh, like I said, I was, I was able to pull this back uh, at a, to a 100 pound drawer, and uh, you know, if you consider that just you know, pulling the bow back, and a drawer needs to have an arrow on it, you know, all right, granted, uh, I'll build up to that. But anyway, let's try this. Hang it. Uh. Wow. Wow, that was so much easier. This is holding back at least 90 pounds. Um, but with where the, that string is, and I've, and I've weighed this, that's actually the distance of the 100 pound drawer. To have a look at my other video for reference. And let's quickly do that right now. You'll see with the image on the right that it looks like I'm drawing the string further back, but there's a very important thing that we need to take into consideration. And it's that the instant legless actually adds an additional handle that is behind the bow's shaft. This pushes the actual shaft a little bit further and therefore the line of the string. If we actually move the shaft of the bow into my grip and move the string back at the same rate, we see that the draw distance of the instant legless is actually very close to my full draw without the instant legless attached. And even though there is still a slight difference, this is still very much within this bow's 100 pound draw length. That was so much easier, okay? Like, like check it out. So just here, just like, oh, oh, mate, <laughs> this is amazing. This is a 100 pound bow and I think it is reducing the draw weight by at least 20, maybe 30 pounds, okay? And I don't even need to grab it. So when I draw it back, right, see this handle here? I can grab it with this hand and hold it all together, but I actually don't need to do that to get it to full draw, but I'll show you this. And so ready, I'll just draw it back. Okay, I'm holding it here like that, like normal, 100 pounds, but with the draw assist, I can hold it back without even grabbing that for a good couple of seconds. <laughs> It's pretty amazing. Oh my goodness. All right. And then because I have that handle, I can draw it back, grab it. This is a, this is a hundred pound. This is a hundred pound wall bow. And I'm holding it back with one way. Hand. <laughs> this is amazing. Oh my goodness. So I'm going to put it down, release the string and let it reset now. Cause there's no arrows in it. It's caught on my glove. It is caught on my glove. Anyway, <laughs> wow, this works incredibly well, this drawing assist, okay, because seriously, like, and you could do this with a forward bow attachment, so you didn't need rubber, so you could do it in the medieval period, okay. One of the issues, because there's a lot of pros and cons when you want to consider uh, war bow archery, heavy, you know, war bow archery in the medieval context, uh, it's very effective, proven by history, but some of the limitations is the difficulty in training the people to be able to do it, okay? There's a reason why the crossbow was so prevalent historically. And I'm already starting to see that this cell war bow attachment is combining all the advantages of a bow and crossbow together and, not, and removing all the disadvantages in comparison between one or the other. I'll explain in detail what I mean later on, but let's give this thing a shoot because... <laughs> Sir, I'm afraid you've gone mad with power. Okay, so here we are. The uh, Sil Warbow is fully loaded. Has five arrows uh, in the magazine at the moment. And uh, this is the very first time I'll be shooting this. Now, I've already kind of adjusted my sight picture for right-sided shooting. And so I wonder how that's going to affect because I really shouldn't be trying to shoot instinctually with this attachment. This allows for sight shooting. I can sight right down, you know, the shaft and aim like that, with, you know, one eye. Now, the advantage is that generally when you do sight shooting, it's easier to develop accuracy 
quicker, okay? It takes a lot longer to learn how to aim instinctually, which is uh, generally the type of aiming you do want to develop if you're doing historical medieval archery like that. Uh, and so this is one of the other advantages of using a crossbow. Crossbow, you can sight when you aim, which means easier to develop accuracy. So let's see if that advantage translates over to instant legless. So I'm going to be aiming for the mannequin with uh, these shots, who I've affectionately named Boromir. <laughs> all right, so uh, let's do this. We need to uh, uh, knock it, all right. Now we're ready to fire. All right, so if I sight down like that. Wow, this thing has so much power in it. The release on that was just epic. And uh, of course, I was off target because I'm a, uh, I, I just need to adjust. First time shooting, okay? So it's going to be a couple of things to try and figure out the sighting of it. So anyway, that was the first shot. Let's see how well the next one loads in. So I go down, then there. Pretty straightforward. So then if I was going to do This thing is almost scary how much power is released on that. You feel it. And those things just launch. We're close to the target. All right, so still adjusting. Because if I had maybe your insight, because you could do an actual targeting, but um, I'm finding I, there actually is a bit of instinctive aiming needing here. I'm needing to do here. Um, all right. So let's do that again. Lock it in. Pull back to you, and then let's do this. That is so powerful. Um, I am going to pause there and get my wrist guard on, just in case, okay? Because I think I'm needing to line this up more and more to get there, there, there to try and do... I either, I have two options here to improve my aim at the moment. I can either move it over like that, Okay, so like that, keep it out, which I think I can do, because if I did like this, increases the likelihood of the string hitting my wrist. And with this massive bow, that's gonna sting like oil. So I'm gonna get my wrist guard, just in case. All right, so uh, now proper, you know, wrist brace on. Uh, let's do the last shot here of uh, this, and then uh, you know, reload, reset, and give it another go. So right down, right up. Let's Aim about like this. Speaking of power, the handle just broke off. The uh, the handle stop for um for this. So you know how there was a handle holding on like that. Just broke off. There is so much power in this thing. There you go. All right, so that's not necessary. I don't need it. It certainly helped, uh, but looks like I'm just going to have to hold it back the uh, traditional way from here on in. I still missed. All right, so this time I want to focus on rate of fire. Aiming is just going to come with practice, of course, and I do honestly believe my aim is going to improve faster with something that I'm sighting than with traditional archery where I'm trying to learn instinctive shooting. That's just kind of an accepted reality of the whole situation. Something I don't really need to practice too much is to see how quickly I can loose these arrows with a warbow, okay? The sill warbow. So let's see how this goes. Ah. Oops, uh, need to keep that in. All right, so we'll start from there. So I'm gonna go. Oh, wow, this thing has such kick. So it's a bit more tricky holding it at, uh, you know, at bay because I don't have the handle anymore. So I, I, just with that one, I noticed that I wasn't getting to full draw. Um, my aim was way off then as well. So I don't know how well I'm going to go with just working on speed. But anyway, let's uh, let's let's keep at this. So we're going to go. Okay, getting a little faster. Let's see how many we can do. Let's, uh, gonna get exhausted, but of course, someone fitter and stronger than me, that wouldn't be too much of a problem. But um, let's focus, let's try and do that speed again. So without that handle, uh, aiming is, 
a lot harder because I got a whole the whole weight of this war bow. Even with the draw assist, okay, so the draw assist lets it off. I think this is coming in around 80 pounds, honestly, compared to my 70 pound one. It's harder to draw this, even with the Amy with the draw assist, and my 70 pound war bow. And so that means trying to line up the shot, I just have to hold it back like it was a 80 pound bow. I mean, it's 100 pound in reality, so the fact that I can even do it with 100 pound is an amazing achievement with this system, but it's still holding it back, which means lining up and sighting a shot, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to achieve in this round of tests. But because of that, all right, let's just focus on uh, rate of fire, okay? Let's see. How fast was that? I was going down, if I was to try and count it out, I was like, one. So that was like an arrow or a bolt every two seconds, I think, which is crazy for a war bow. Insane. <laughs> My aiming was all over the place. Don't judge me, okay? People are always hypercritical about these things, especially skeptics and stuff, all right? Aiming or good accuracy comes with practice, all right? And I'm shooting at a disadvantage without a holding thing. So I think towards the end, I will just be focusing on trying to get something hit. But like I said, right then, that was just a speed test. And oh my goodness, was it fast, all right? Now, the trick will be in speed of reloading, because that's where you might lose some of the speed advantage. But Jörg has already made a stripper clip for the bolts. Something that holds them all in line, so you can put them in in a row, and then just take the stripper out, and they're also already loaded. And if you could reload that quickly, and then try and develop what the rate of fire would be, I mean, with a war bow we're talking about, and I'm not even trained to that much to do speed, someone can gain a crazy rate of fire with very minimal training through this system. And so reloading another four or five bolts, uh, like it's hard to try and measure how fast that would be if I was using a stripper clip. And so if I had them like on my belt, I was able to draw them and just kind of slot them in like that, bang, that's how fast it would have taken, right? Oh, sorry, pull out the stripper clip. So there, bang, on, ready to go. So I think that would probably add, what, maybe 0.2? Uh, to each arrow, maybe if you evened it out, maybe less. If we're talking about amount of arrows you can shoot in a minute. So that still leaves us around the, you know, one arrow every two seconds mark on a war bow, okay? People have tried to say speed shooting isn't going to be uh, too uh, effective with a war bow because it takes too long to draw it. Well, my, I'm actually personally going to be trying to test that, to, even with this bow, because if I can get as, you know, build up the strength to be able to shoot this 100 pound as easy as I can do my 70 pound, well, I can shoot 16 arrows in a minute with my 70 pound bow. Now, that's not, a, I could get a lot faster because you'll see, you know, in my test one, I'm still fumbling a bit when I draw it, getting it on the string, and so that can even improve. And so would I be able to match the speed, rate of fire, just with the bow by itself without the sill compared to the sill? Don't know, it's gonna be darn difficult, but even if I could, even if anyone could, okay, the amount of training it takes to develop that compared to the rate of fire I had on my first go at this, this is the first session I'm shooting this, is insane. And so one of the massive advantages of this system is the fact that you are achieving some really high level kind of results in terms of rate of fire and uh, Accuracy comes with time, and we'll see how that goes. In a really short amount of time, compared to, you know, on the traditional bow where you need to train for years to develop it. Whoa, that's not good. Gonna need to leave that one there, I'm thinking. So what was actually happening here is that the instant Legolas was under so much tension from the high poundage of this bow that the sliding rail portion was actually getting pushed out of its housing and was almost popping out completely. And if I kept pushing it, it would have actually popped out and potentially caused an injury. So because unfortunately it was starting to fail and break apart, I had to stop my tests 
there. But I want to stress that the proof of concept in Jörg's Silbo attachment has been proven. This absolutely works, and all that this needed to be able to work consistently with such a heavy bow would be a bit of additional reinforcement so it could hold together. This is the first time that the sill has really been put through its paces on such a heavy bow, and by doing so we are bound to find the limits of this version of the sill. So that is really unfortunate because I did want to test this thing to the limit, and I guess you could say I kind of did that because it has reached its limit. Um, and, but I wanted to develop better accuracy, uh, try the speed shooting and see if I can get even a faster rate of fire. And I really think I could have, okay? We, I reckon we could get this down to maybe an arrow every one and a half seconds, uh, depending. Of course, I haven't even seen what the actual time is. Could have been a bit more, could have been a bit less. But in any regard, just with that initial kind of test, we're able to see that the rate of fire was very impressive. And as to accuracy, once again, that will come with time, okay? And uh, there are inherent advantages with this system through the sighting method, even though I wasn't able to nail that down with just the test that I was able to do, it certainly is there, the advantages are there. But what are those advantages specifically? Because I mentioned towards the beginning of this video that I really think the SIL, you know, war bow uh, attachment combines all the advantages of a bow and a crossbow together. And to understand that, you need to understand what are the pros and cons of the bow versus the crossbow. In terms of lethality, okay, how deadly either one of these, you know, uh, weapons are, they're actually about equal, and people can really misunderstand that because crossbows, uh, they have a very high poundage, okay? Above the 200, sometimes 300, 400, like they get really, really high, and people then assume that the uh, speed in which the bolt, you know, leaves the crossbow must be four or five times as, as you know, faster than that of the arrows loosed from a war bow. That's actually not really the case. It's very dependent. Of course, it changes based on the poundage of the crossbow versus the poundage of the war bow. But there's a big difference which actually evens the playing field between a crossbow and a war bow, and it's a thing called the power stroke. And so with this war bow right here, the power stroke is the distance that the, the string needs to, you know, move before it, does, it stops, okay? Now, in contrast to that to crossbows, their power strokes are actually much shorter, which means the crossbow actually has a shorter amount of time to accelerate the bolt, but it has a higher poundage to try and compensate. Looking at bows, the bowstring has a much longer distance to be able to impart energy onto the arrow and then accelerate the arrow. Because remember, the string, it'll start at a, well, a speed of zero, and then as soon as you loose it, it starts to accelerate, accelerating, accelerating, accelerating until it suddenly comes to an instant stop uh, not instant of course there's you know uh, flex and everything but when the string goes tight the more distance it has to travel the more opportunity it has to impart energy into the arrow ergo the arrow will go faster this is the pro and con and so the higher poundage on a crossbow is kind of balanced out by the fact it has such a short power stroke why don't they increase the power stroke of a crossbow well it's a matter of convenience in my opinion i think uh, todd from todd workshop could actually share some greater insight but if we were to pretend that this was a crossbow now have a look at how far the limbs are extending on either side if i was in like a uh, formation I'd be getting tangled, knocked up with everyone on either side. It would be very hard to use on top of a uh, battlement on a castle or something like that. And so it's actually far more uh, useful, far more beneficial to have the limbs of a crossbow to be shorter. But if the limbs on the crossbow is shorter, that also decreases the length of the power stroke. And so to get a more powerful crossbow then is you just need to increase the poundage. But then we come to one of the biggest limiting factors of a crossbow, and that is loading the darn thing because the poundages can get so high on crossbows again to try and compensate for their short power stroke is that for the really high poundage crossbows you need a mechanism to help assist loading it okay sometimes it gets to full windlasses where you're winding the thing to get it in okay these are on the really really big ones and so the rate of fire for you know historical crossbows are a Abysmal. But they can loose a projectile, in this case a bolt, and so a bolt is basically a shorter arrow, if I can get it out with my gloves on. Ugh. So this is a bolt, because, you know, shorter, but it's essentially, you know, small arrow. Crossbows can shoot these of comparable speeds, but to do it you need a uh, loading assist, and therefore the rate of fire is garbage. And so, why then do people use crossbows? They're more expensive to build, alright, than just an average bow. Their rate of fire is abysmal, but 
they are easier to become accurate with than with a bow. Bow takes a lot more training. The other big, really big significant difference between a crossbow and a regular bow is that with a crossbow you don't need to be have the actual physical strength to load the thing if you're using a loading assisted mechanism, assisting mechanism. Whether that's a windlass or a goat's foot or something like that. Goat's foot still takes a bit of muscle, but uh, with an actual you know, windlass or crank or something like that, you don't need the strength. And so to have a unit of bowmen, okay, that are shooting, you know, really powerful bows, it takes years to train them, and it takes years for them to develop the strength to be able to shoot them of the high enough power to be really effective against things like armor. And so the crossbow circumvents most of that because you can train a person much quicker to be accurate with a crossbow, and they can be really powerful without the person needing the physical strength. And so just by breaking this down, we've actually been able to find the benefits and detriments to both the bow and the crossbow. What were the benefits of the crossbow? Easy to become accurate, you don't need the physical strength to be able to shoot it. Benefits of the bow, rate of fire, big one. And the projectiles shot from bows can be just as powerful, detriments, time it takes to train to be able to shoot accurately, and the time it takes to develop the physical strength to do it. Now let's have a look at the sill here, okay? Does it overcome the pros and cons of each one? Well, I do think it'll be easier to, to become accurate with the sill than with instinctive shooting, uh, depending, depends on how much you shoot, but uh, I obviously needed more training and I was unable to do the amount needed to really hone in what my sight picture with this system here uh, before the thing started to break apart because it just needs me extra reinforcement. But okay, uh, I think that covers it. You'll be able to become more accurate faster with this system. Do you need to develop as much physical strength to get the power? Well, with a loading assist, you don't need to develop as much strength to shoot more powerful bows. And so it overcomes two of the detriments that bows traditionally have. And then if you look at crossbows, it really overcomes one of the biggest problems with a crossbow, and that's in the rate of fire, because you saw how fast this thing was. And so then it get, takes the advantages of a crossbow, which is easy to develop accuracy, you don't need as much physical strength, and it takes the advantages of a bow, which is rate of fire, because this is the thing, it's not to say you can't match these advantages with traditional archery with enough training and practice. I think you can, rate of fire is a bit of a eh, uh, but you know, just develop the strength and aiming and everything. The advantage of this system is that you'd be able to equip an army, a unit of men, and get them to a, a similar level of efficacy, rate of fire, accuracy and stuff, in a much shorter period of time. And so you get the advantages that the crossbow had, but the rate of fire of a bow. So this really does combine all the benefits of the bow and the crossbow, which is why I think this system is amazing. If you think the cost of making one of these things would be too high, have a look at some of the crossbows, okay? And the sophistication and complexity that was in their windlasses, their, their cranks, okay, to just load the things. I actually think because a lot of those, uh, you know, pieces would need to be made out of metal and stuff, that the difficulty making those are actually just as high, if not perhaps even a little bit higher, because you could make this mostly out of wood with some more reinforcement, because I think one thing we really found out about using a war bow with this thing is just for the level of reinforcements that's on it at the moment, the war bow's too powerful. The the shock, the the, the, the power of this thing, the, the, like, was breaking it apart, literally, okay? But with extra reinforcement, solved. That would be completely solved, not a problem. And in actual fact, I probably might be trying to reinforce this myself. Reinforce the rail housing here, reattach a, a stronger handle or something, and give this another go to get more accurate and also to really test that rate of fire as well. And just ending off that thought process I was talking about in terms of the cost of manufacturing, even with the higher cost of building crossbows, Large armies equipped vast amounts of men with crossbows, so it was done historically already, and I think if something like this, if they knew how to build something like this, uh, absolutely, because remember, you have the advantage of that power stroke, like, with it being so much longer, and unlike, you know, a crossbow where it needs to be held like that, you can hold this vertically and not get in the way of any other men in your rank and file, just like a bow, which is why I think this is still a bow. You should call this a bow, not a crossbow, because mainly the way you're aiming. You're aiming with it more like a bow, and uh, the uh, the limbs are vertical in respect to yourself. And so there we go. This has been my detailed thoughts and review of the sill attachment to a hundred pound 
war bow. I think it is absolutely brilliant. I think Jörg is a bit of a genius myself and I love it and I honestly, yeah, I do think this could have uh, changed history if something like this was invented back then. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed. Of course, I hope to see you again as well. Thank you to Jörg. Please check out his channel and his videos on the uh, Instant Legolas or Cell because they're just awesome videos in this. Especially, you get to see his developmental process, all the changes and the improvements he's made along the way. Heaps of fun and just awesome channel as well. So please do go check out the Slingshot channel. And once again, thank you for watching. And until next time, farewell.